Who was Jane Addams? Jane Addams, 1860-1935, was the first woman public intellectual in the United States. She was a close colleague of both John Dewey, 1859-1952, and George Herbert Mead, 1863-1931. In 1931 Adams was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for her progressive public activities in beginning the Settlement House Movement. The Settlement Movement involved locating places for assisting members of impoverished immigrant communities, directly in their neighborhoods. Adams began the services of Hull House with art appreciation classes and quickly developed a program of education for youth. Child care, instruction in domestic skills, and adult education. She was only recovered as a philosopher and feminist in the late 20th century. Her main works include Democracy and Social Ethics, 1902, Newer Ideals of Peace, 1906, 20 Years at Hull House, 1910, and Second 20 Years at Hull House, 1930. The Long Road of Woman's Memory, 1916, and Peace and Bread in Time of War, 1922. Did Russell have a humorous side? Although he suffered from depression on and off throughout his life, this did not suppress Russell's wit. As the following quotes show, the whole problem with the world is that Fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves, and wiser people so full of doubts. I would never die for my beliefs because I might be wrong. It has been said that man is a rational animal. All my life I have been searching for evidence which could support this. Aristotle maintained that women have fewer teeth than men, although he was twice married. It never occurred to him to verify this statement by examining his wives' mouths. What is ethical naturalism? Ethical naturalism holds that goodness is a natural property and that Morality can be understood without intuitions, conscience, or religion. What were John Dewey's main philosophical ideas? Dewey brought ordinary life into philosophy. His main concept was experience, first for a cognitive Hegelian subject, and later as a more inclusive emotional and active dimension of human life. Dewey argued, against philosophical idealists and indeed most other philosophers of his day, that most of what is important in our experience is not reflective. Unlike the Hegelians, he also insisted that there was not a unified whole of all experience, but many interlocking versions or kinds of experience. Experience, for Dewey, was thus pluralistic. But the experience of the concrete human individual 
or the real person, was the primary form of experience for Dewey. Dewey sought to articulate the anthropological and biological nature of lived human experience. He saw this as a new form of empiricism. Against criticism that he was neglecting what was objective in writing and speaking as though experience was everything. Dewey developed a metaphysical account of experience. What was John Dewey's metaphysics? Dewey held that nature has different transactions, or kinds of action, that have mutual causes and effects between or among their components. Dewey's transactions are thus interactions. There are three evolutionary levels, or plateaus, of transactions, physiochemical, psychophysical, and human experience. Physiochemical reactions are simply what can be studied by physics and chemistry. Psychophysical transactions are connections between mind and body. Human experience is exactly how things seem to human beings as they go about their lives. What were some of Josiah Royce's metaphysical ideas? Royce's metaphysical system was intended to solve the problems posed by a religious worldview. He believed that what exists is a totality of everything that is known. So that the nature of being can be understood by understanding how it comes to be known. Although knowledge starts with data from the senses, to arrive at the idea of a public object. As well as a past and future, transcendence is necessary. Transcendental judgment is not isolated, but part of a system of judgments. Such a system can account for error as a failure to define an object. An idea is a purpose that seeks an object, but the object in turn clarifies the original idea. The infinite is real, because the absolute, which is one, represents itself along with everything else that mirrors it. How did William James express his own will to believe? In the 1880s, James wanted to apply scientific methodology to mind reading and spiritualism. He could not find collaborators in the Harvard academic community. But in England at that time both Alfred Russell Wallace, who had discovered the theory of evolution at the same time as Charles Darwin, and the moral philosopher Henry Sidgwick, 1838-1900, and his wife, Nora, were already interested in subjects of this sort. James became part of a group of intellectuals who went to seances and carefully investigated reports of supernatural events. They also counted reports of apparitions that occurred on the same day the person whose apparition appeared, had died. This so-called census of hallucinations resulted in a statistically significant correlation between day of death and appearance of that person's ghost. However, 
James thought that the sample of 17,000 would have yielded more reliable results if it were 50,000 and included American as well as British apparitions. James was also very skeptical of the table wrapping and spirit directed writing that were routine at seances. And he wanted to exclude mediums from the ranks of reputable spiritual researchers. What are some key facts about John Dewey's life and career? Dewey was born in 1859 in Burlington, Vermont, where his father was a grocer. He attended the University of Vermont and then taught classics, science, and algebra at a high school in Oil City, Pennsylvania, and then in Burlington, Vermont. Unsure of his future direction, but encouraged by former teachers. He applied to the new graduate program in philosophy at Johns Hopkins University but was turned down for a fellowship twice. Dewey finally borrowed $500 from an aunt to attend. He thereby became part of the first generation able to obtain PhDs in philosophy in the United States. Dewey's teachers at Johns Hopkins were philosophers George Sylvester Morris. 1840 to 1889, and Charles Sanders Pierce, 1839 to 1914, and psychologist G. Stanley Hall, 1844 to 1924. At first, Dewey was very interested in Hegelian ideas of organism, that the living being interacts with its environment. And that society is an organic whole that can be viewed as an organism. After writing a dissertation on Immanuel Kant, 17241804, he taught at the University of Michigan from 1884 to 1894. At this time he became interested in public education and progressive politics, as well as psychology. In 1894 Dewey became chair of the Department of Philosophy psychology, and education at the University of Chicago. At Chicago, working with colleagues, he began to develop activist social theories. This resulted in the 1903 Studies in Logical Theory, which was dedicated to William James, 1842-1910. Dewey had a national reputation when he left Chicago for Columbia University. The Journal of Philosophy, published by the Columbia Philosophy Department, became an outlet for his ideas and a forum for discussion of them over the decades. Dewey lectured in Tokyo, Peking, and Nanking, and studied education in Turkey, Mexico, and Russia. In retirement, Dewey chaired the 1937 Mexican Commission investigating charges against Russian revolutionary Leon Trotsky, which produced a report, not guilty. He also defended Bertrand Russell in 1941, when Russell was denied a teaching opportunity at City College, New York, because of his political ideas. What is the difference between ethics and morals? Philosophers tend to use the terms interchangeably. In ordinary usage, however, morals refers to private behavior. 
whereas ethics refers to public, professional, or civic behavior. Thus, while judgments about a person's morals can be about sexual behavior and drinking habits, judgments about ethics often concern the obligations of people in positions of responsibility, for example, medical ethics. How were virtue ethics rediscovered in analytic philosophy? Aristotelian virtue ethics, mainly as expressed in Aristotle's 384 to 322 b. C. Nicomachean ethics were revisited in analytic philosophy to create rationalist moral systems. According to Aristotle, we develop our individual virtues through a rational process of deliberating and then choosing what to do in action. The revival of Aristotelian ethics was sometimes pursued in Opposition to other prominent moral systems and moral theories. Philippa Foote, 1920, and Alastair McIntyre, 1929, are noteworthy 20th century virtue ethicists. Who was Josiah Royce? Josiah Royce, 1855-1916, is known as an absolute pragmatist. He sought to combine German and British absolute idealism with American pragmatism. Royce was born in Grass Valley, California, which, at the time following the gold rush, was a mining town. His family moved to San Francisco when he was 11 and he graduated from the University of California in 1875, he then received a Ph.D. from Johns Hopkins University in 1878. Royce also studied at universities in Leipzig and Göttingen. After which he taught English at the University of California for four years. In 1882, he was invited to join Harvard's philosophy department, where he eventually became a professor and led a highly acclaimed and distinguished career. Royce's major publications are The World and the Individual, 1899. Sources of Religious Insight, 1912, The Problem of Christianity, 1913, War and Insurance, 1914. The Hope of the Great Community, 1916, and Lectures on Modern Idealism, 1919. Also available is Royce's Logical Essays, Collected Logical Essays of Josiah Royce, 1951. What was the Bloomsbury Group? The Bloomsbury Group was a loose group of friends, the men of which were Cambridge graduates. They met in the evenings for drink and talk at the house of author Virginia Woolf's sister, Vanessa Bell. The house was in the Bloomsbury district of London, and hence this name. Its initial members, before 1910, were, the novelist E. M. Forster, Mary McCarthy, and Virginia Woolf, economist John Maynard Keynes, the novelist, biographer. 
and critic Lytton Strachey, and the painters Duncan Grant, Vanessa Bell, and Roger Fry. All were close or intimate friends long before they individually became famous. G. E. Moore 1873-1958, served as an intellectual ideal and mentor to the group. He was particularly revered by the others for his Principia Ethica. 1903, and the model of clarity he provided for all intellectual work. Above all, the Bloomsbury members were inspired by Moore's idea that art and friendship have intrinsic value they re good in themselves and serve no higher purpose. What is phenomenalism? Not to be confused with phenomenology, phenomenalism is the empiricist doctrine that sense data or the sensory organs impression of perception could be used to explain the meaning of sentences about perceptual objects. Some believe that perceptual objects themselves such as a computer, a desk, or a car could be reduced to sense data. This last ontological version of phenomenalism would involve a general commitment to philosophical idealism or the doctrine that the only things that are real are mental phenomena. What was G? E. Moore's naturalistic fallacy. Moore, 1873 to 1958, contended that goodness cannot be analyzed in terms of any other property. In his Principia Ethica, 1903, he wrote, it may be true that all things which are good are also something else. Just as it is true that all things which are yellow produce a certain kind of vibration in the light. And it is a fact, that ethics aims at discovering what are. Those other properties belonging to all things which are good. But far too many philosophers have thought that when they named those other properties they were actually defining good. Moore thought that we know what is good directly, just as we know the color yellow when we see it. Thus, we can only point to an action or a thing and say that is good. We cannot describe to a blind man exactly what yellow is. We can only show a sighted man a piece of yellow paper or a yellow scrap of cloth and say that is yellow. The same is true of what is good. What did Bertrand Russell think about his use of logic? Russell believed that logic could be used to solve both philosophical problems and everyday ones. If propositions were translated into the correct logical form. To accomplish this, he held the ideal of a logically correct language. For a while he thought that his student Ludwig Wittgenstein. 1889-1951 was on the right path toward supplying that. But Wittgenstein only alluded to such a language in his early work and abandoned the project later on.
What is moral conventionalism? Ethical or moral conventionalism is the view that what makes something good or an action right is a general cultural belief. Ethical conventionalism has descriptive and prescriptive forms. Prescriptive conventionalism says that we ought to follow conventions, descriptive conventionalism says that we do follow conventions. Did John Dewey hold views on education for children? Yes, and some have considered this unusual in a philosopher. He was married twice and had six children himself and adopted three. Although Dewey did not want to be known as an educator, because it would detract from his philosophical reputation. His contribution to education was at least as lasting as his philosophical innovations. When Dewey began to consider education, school children were expected to sit quietly and absorb information passively. While Dewey did not believe in a completely child-centered method of instruction, he emphasized the activity of learning, with an understanding that children are already curious and energetic participants in common, ordinary life outside the classroom. Dewey thought that children should be taught skills to solve problems. Including moral problems. When he became chair of the Department of Philosophy, Psychology, and Education at the University of Chicago, he founded the Laboratory School. It was based on his theory of education, the motto of which was learn by doing. However, he acknowledged practical advice from Ella Flagg Young. The first woman president of the National Education Association. Who was able to translate his ideas into actual practices and exercises in the classroom. He was also in contact with Jane Addams, who had co-founded the educational mission at Hull House. Dewey spent considerable time there himself. Talking to working people about their problems and aspirations. His 1899 The School and Society was a bestseller. Dewey's subsequent works on education were The Child and the Curriculum. 1902, How We Think, 1910, and Democracy and Education, 1916. What is ethical, or moral, relativism? There are two kinds, descriptive moral relativism is the view that different cultures have different moral beliefs. Prescriptive or normative moral relativism is the view that the whole of what's right is what people in a given society think is right. The result of this view is that moral disagreement can't be rationally debated. What were Josiah Royce's ethical and religious views? The primary virtue according to Royce was loyalty to loyalty. While some people are loyal to bad causes. 
only good causes could support the loyalty to themselves that constituted loyalty to loyalty. In Royce's interpretation of Christianity, the Church, sin, and atonement were united by God as Spirit. Royce's idea of the role of God as Spirit, in community, was perceived as addressing a neglected aspect of the doctrine of the Trinity. Christian religious history, in emphasizing God and Jesus, had often minimized the Holy Spirit. Although it should be noted that his emphasis on community is similar to Martin Buber's. 1878-1965, Description of how Judaism differs from Christianity. What is ethical subjectivism? Ethical subjectivism is either the same as ethical emotivism, or the view that ethical judgments express our shared emotions. Or else it refers to an individual's private moral views as the meaning of morality. So that in principle there could be as many moral systems as there are individuals. What is logical positivism? A new generation of thinkers who were influenced by Bertrand Russell. 1872-1970, and Ludwig Wittgenstein, 1889-1951, created a 20th century version of Augusta Kohn's. 1798 to 1857, 19th century intellectual endorsement of science. The term logical positivism was coined in 1930 by two supporters, E. Kyla and A. Petzal. Philosophers who were part of the early movement that logical positivism came to represent. The 20th century positivists Moritz Schlick, 1882-1936, Rudolf Carnap, 1891-1970, Otto Neurath. 1882-1945, and in England, A.J. Eyre, 1910-1989, were members of what became known as the Vienna Circle. Who was Alfred Tarski? Alfred Tarski, 1902-1983, was a logician. Born in Poland, he taught at the University of California at Berkeley from 1942 to 1958. He is famous for his theory of truth that appeared in The Concept of Truth in Formalized Languages, 1933, which appeared in the Polish journal Prace Torzist We Nocko We Go Warzowski Go, Wigel 3 Nock Mate Matizno Fizesnik, and was translated into English in Logic, Semantics, Metamathematics, papers from 1923 to 1938, 1983. According to Tarski, any theory of truth should imply the truth of T sentences in natural languages. For example, snow is white in English is true if and only if snow is white is a T sentence. It is important to notice that Tarski's theory of truth does not specify what constitutes truth but is rather about how true sentences can be defined.
who was Ludwig Wittgenstein. Ludwig Wittgenstein, 1889-1951, had two distinct philosophical periods. First, was his ambitious development of logical atomism that was influenced by his teacher Bertrand Russell. 1872-1970, resulting in his writing Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, 1921. Second was Wittgenstein's original, ordinary language theory of philosophy. This was an original insight about ordinary language. Wittgenstein was unquestionably a genius. What did Ludwig Wittgenstein accomplish in his Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus? Although the work is considered one of the greatest achievements in philosophy, it's really not clear. Wittgenstein's stated intention was to address the problems of philosophy that had preoccupied Gottlob Freya. 1848-1925, and Bertrand Russell, 1872-1970, Arthur Schopenhauer. 1788-1860, was another influence on the work although he said at the end of this work. My propositions serve as elucidations in the following way, anyone who understands me eventually recognizes them as nonsensical. At the beginning of the book, Wittgenstein claims that his main purpose is ethical. The Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus consists of seven sets of numbered propositions or statements, which are believed to be about the connection between language and the world. It seems to present an account of the essence of language as expressive of thought. Thought according to Wittgenstein, is limited to what is factual so that the propositions of language are representations of the world. The propositions of logic, on the other hand, convey no factual information logic consists of tautologies. Logic is very useful, but all of its conclusions are true by definition. Wittgenstein believed that a meaningful sentence must have a precise structure that is made up of simple. In Russell's language, atomic, sentences or simple names. Atomic sentences are pictures of states of affairs. Working backwards from this picture theory of meaning it would follow that. Given the ideal logical language, the world itself has a logical structure. Wittgenstein was to later abandon this view in favor of philosophical activity that consisted of descriptive analysis of ordinary language. But before he did that, the Tractatus had enormous influence on the new 20th century school of thought known as logical positivism. Was the Vienna Circle an actual organization? Yes, it was a discussion group of scientists and philosophers in Vienna. Who held meetings from 1922 to 1938. Its members were highly influential in setting the subject matter of future analytic philosophy. Ethics, Political Philosophy, Philosophy of Science Philosophy of Language, 
excluding ordinary language philosophy, and philosophy of mind. What was the emotivist theory of ethics? According to the logical positivists, statements had meaning only if it could be said what would verify or falsify them. In terms of descriptions of sensory experience, because both moral and aesthetic statements could not meet this test. They were considered not to have empirical meaning but to be expressive of how the person uttering them felt. So, to say, this is right, would be equal to saying, I like this. A.J. Ayer 1910-1989, put forth this view in language, truth, and logic. 1936. A more comprehensive account was given by Charles L. Stevenson, 1908 to 1979, in Ethics and Language, 1944. Stevenson argued that moral judgments do not have cognitive meaning, but rather emotive meaning. He meant that moral judgments are not factual in nature, but are rather emotional reactions to facts, which are sometimes meant to influence others. If the facts or other circumstances changed, so could the moral judgment. What was Alastair McIntyre's contribution to virtue ethics? Alastair McIntyre, 1929, has approached ethics with a rejection of both Marxism and late 20th century consumer capitalism. In his return to Thomistic Aristotelianism, or Aristotelianism influenced by the altruistic and religious values of Christianity, he considers the nature of moral argument about competing systems and has reclaimed Edith Stein, 1891-1942. McIntyre views virtues as moral qualities needed to fulfill human potential. He has focused on the combination of practice, virtue, and tradition. Practice is communal action. Virtue is the individual dispositions and habits that are necessary to participate in practice. Tradition is the history of a community as an object of reflection. McIntyre thus thinks that virtues develop and are practiced in communities. And that moral communities must be understood in terms of their history. McIntyre's view is not intended to be conservative in a social or political sense. But is instead developed as an understanding of Aristotelian virtues that would not have been possible without the fact of all the history that has ensued since Aristotle wrote. What was Alastair McIntyre's contribution to virtue ethics? Alastair McIntyre 1929, has approached ethics with a rejection of both Marxism and late 20th century consumer capitalism. In his return to Thomistic Aristotelianism, or Aristotelianism influenced by the altruistic and religious values of Christianity, he considers the nature of moral argument. 
about competing systems and has reclaimed Edith Stein, 1891-1942. As a phenomenologist, McIntyre views virtues as moral qualities needed to fulfill human potential. He has focused on the combination of practice, virtue, and tradition, practice is communal action. Virtue is the individual dispositions and habits that are necessary to participate in practice. Tradition is the history of a community as an object of reflection. McIntyre thus thinks that virtues develop and are practiced in communities. And that moral communities must be understood in terms of their history. McIntyre's view is not intended to be conservative in a social or political sense, but is instead developed as an understanding of Aristotelian virtues that would not have been possible without the fact of all the history that has ensued since Aristotle wrote. Who was Ayn Rand? Ayn Rand, 1905-1982, was a Russian-born American novelist who reacted strongly against communist and socialist political ideals, as well as Christian virtues of altruism. She is most famous for extolling the virtue of selfishness. In both her novels and her philosophy of objectivism. Her most popular novels are We the Living, 1936, The Fountainhead, 1943, and Atlas Shrugged, 1957. Who was Ayn Rand? Ayn Rand, 1905-1982, was a Russian-born American novelist who reacted strongly against communist and socialist political ideals, as well as Christian virtues of altruism. She is most famous for extolling the virtue of selfishness. In both her novels and her philosophy of objectivism. Her most popular novels are We the Living, 1936, The Fountainhead, 1943, and Atlas Shrugged, 1957. What was Ayn Rand's virtue of selfishness? Rand believed that the highest human good was individual happiness, which is achieved through rationality. Every individual has an elevated duty to further his or her own self-interest and others do not have a right to demand that one sacrifice oneself or one's interests simply because they are weaker or in need. In this sense, Rand was an ethical egoist. What was Ayn Rand's virtue of selfishness? Rand believed that the highest human good was individual happiness, which is achieved through rationality. Every individual has an elevated duty to further his or her own self-interest. And others do not have a right to demand that one sacrifice oneself or one's interests simply because they are weaker or in need. In this sense, Rand was an ethical egoist.
What is ethical egoism? Ethical egoism is the moral system that everyone ought to pursue his or her own self-interest above all other goals. As with ethical relativism, it has both a descriptive and prescriptive form. Descriptive ethical egoism holds that everyone always pursues their own self-interest. Prescriptive ethical egoism holds that everyone should always pursue his or her own self-interest. Insofar as she thought that communism and socialism were evil and widespread, Ayn Rand. 1905-1982, was not a descriptive ethical egoist, although she was clearly a prescriptive ethical egoist. What is ethical egoism? Ethical egoism is the moral system that everyone ought to pursue his or her own self-interest above all other goals. As with ethical relativism, it has both a descriptive and prescriptive form. Descriptive ethical egoism holds that everyone always pursues their own self-interest. Prescriptive ethical egoism holds that everyone should always pursue his or her own self-interest. Insofar as she thought that communism and socialism were evil and widespread, Ayn Rand. 1905-1982, was not a descriptive ethical egoist, although she was clearly a prescriptive ethical egoist. What was Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism? Most professional philosophers refer to Rand's, 1905-1982, objectivism as a so-called philosophy. Rand claimed to have taught herself the history of Western philosophy in a matter of months which left her a passionate follower of Aristotle, 384-322 BCE. She believed that Aristotle's law of identity, or A is A, is a metaphysical principle on which can be based the existence of an objective world that is knowable through reason. Rand remains popular on many contemporary college campuses. Although more for her novels and doctrine of selfishness than for her metaphysics. Most professional philosophers before and after Rand have held A is a to be a tautology. Telling us nothing about the world, be it objective or otherwise. What was Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism? Most professional philosophers refer to Rand's, 1905-1982, objectivism as a so-called philosophy. Rand claimed to have taught herself the history of Western philosophy in a matter of months which left her a passionate follower of Aristotle, 384-322 BCE. She believed that Aristotle's law of identity, or A is A, is a metaphysical principle on which can be based the existence of an objective world that is knowable through reason. Rand remains popular on many contemporary college campuses.
although more for her novels and doctrine of selfishness than for her metaphysics. Most professional philosophers before and after Rand have held A is a to be a tautology. Telling us nothing about the world, be it objective or otherwise. What is consequentialism? Consequentialism is the 20th century version of 19th century utilitarianism. The utilitarian moral system held that we should act so that the greatest pleasure or happiness for the greatest number results. With everyone counting for one and no one counting for more than one. G. E. Moore's 1873-1958 Ideal utilitarianism specified that the goods we should seek as the result of our actions are aesthetic experiences and relations of friendship. Consequentialism is a more general form of utilitarianism that holds that we should act so as to bring about the best consequences, or act to maximize the results. Contemporary consequentialists often speak of preference satisfaction as the ultimate consequence that has intrinsic value. Preference satisfaction is getting what one wants. There is also discussion about the distribution of consequences. Whether it is better that all involved get equal shares or whether it is sufficient if the total good or average good is increased. Act consequentialism specifies that we should do the action that has the best consequences. And rule consequentialism specifies that we should do the action that is an instance of the rule that has the best consequences. All of these issues and others have been discussed in J.J.C. Smart, 1920, and Bernard Williams, 1929-2003, Utilitarianism, For and Against, 1973, and Samuel Scheffler's, 1951, The Rejection of Consequentialism, 1994. There have also been attempts to relate consequentialism to ordinary language philosophy. Most notably by R. Hare, 1919-2002. What is consequentialism? Consequentialism is the 20th century version of 19th century utilitarianism. The utilitarian moral system held that we should act so that the greatest pleasure or happiness for the greatest number results. With everyone counting for one and no one counting for more than one. G. E. Moore's 1873-1958 Ideal utilitarianism specified that the goods we should seek as the result of our actions are aesthetic experiences and relations of friendship. Consequentialism is a more general form of utilitarianism that holds that we should act so as to bring about the best consequences, or act to maximize the results. Contemporary consequentialists often speak of preference satisfaction as the ultimate consequence that has intrinsic value. Preference satisfaction is getting what one wants. There is also discussion about the distribution of consequences. 
whether it is better that all involved get equal shares or whether it is sufficient if the total good or average good is increased. Act consequentialism specifies that we should do the action that has the best consequences. And rule consequentialism specifies that we should do the action that is an instance of the rule that has the best consequences. All of these issues and others have been discussed in JJC Smart, 1920. And Bernard Williams, 1929 to 2003, Utilitarianism, for and against. 1973, and Samuel Scheffler's, 1951, The Rejection of Consequentialism, 1994. There have also been attempts to relate consequentialism to ordinary language philosophy. Most notably by R. Hare, 1919-2002. Who was R? Hair? Richard Mervyn Hare, 1919-2002, was a professor of moral philosophy at Oxford University. And he later taught at the University of Florida. In his The Language of Morals, 1992, he argued for the prescriptive nature of moral judgments and their universalizability, or ability to be generalized. In Freedom and Reason, 1963, and Moral Thinking, Its Levels, Method, and Point, 1981. Hare held that ethical concepts are used according to logical rules that support the truth of utilitarianism. The utilitarianism propounded by Hare was two tier. Providing for both act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism. Act utilitarianism requires that we do singular actions that will result in the best consequences. Whereas rule utilitarianism requires that we follow rules that will result in the best consequences. Who was R? Hair? Richard Mervyn Hare, 1919-2002, was a professor of moral philosophy at Oxford University. And he later taught at the University of Florida. In his The Language of Morals, 1992, he argued for the prescriptive nature of moral judgments and their universalizability, or ability to be generalized. In Freedom and Reason, 1963, and Moral Thinking, Its Levels, Method, and Point, 1981. Hare held that ethical concepts are used according to logical rules that support the truth of utilitarianism. The utilitarianism propounded by Hare was two tier. Providing for both act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism. Act utilitarianism requires that we do singular actions that will result in the best consequences. Whereas rule utilitarianism requires that we follow rules that will result in the best consequences. Have some philosophers criticized consequentialism?
Elizabeth Onscombe, 1910 to 2001, in a 1958 article, Modern Moral Philosophy. Coined the term consequentialism when she criticized 20th century versions of utilitarianism that did not distinguish between intended and unintended consequences. Onscombe argued that only intended consequences have moral value. Onscombe is also famous for her defense of Thomas Aquinas, c. 1225 to 1274, Doctrine of Double Effect, DDE. According to DDE, an action is morally permissible if it has known bad consequences, but it is not the intention or goal of the person performing the action to bring about those consequences. In Jesuit moral reasoning about performing craniotomies, operations to crush a baby's skull so that the baby can be extracted to save its mother's life, DDE has been used. If it is not the obstetrician's goal to kill the baby but merely to extract it, craniotomies are deemed permissible. Onscombe provided this example, say she meets her mortal enemy on a cliff. If her enemy falls off because she accidentally falls against him, she is blameless. Even though the unintended effect of the enemy's death is welcome to her, after the fact. Others have criticized the ways in which consequentialism seems to ignore issues of justice in cases where an unjust act or even a human sacrifice might serve to maximize benefits for others. Have some philosophers criticized consequentialism? Elizabeth Onscombe, 1910 to 2001, in a 1958 article, Modern Moral Philosophy. Coined the term consequentialism when she criticized 20th century versions of Utilitarianism that did not distinguish between intended and unintended consequences. Onscombe argued that only intended consequences have moral value. Onscombe is also famous for her defense of Thomas Aquinas, c. 1225 to 1274, Doctrine of Double Effect, DDE. According to DDE, an action is morally permissible if it has known bad consequences but it is not the intention or goal of the person performing the action to bring about those consequences. In Jesuit moral reasoning about performing craniotomies, operations to crush a baby's skull so that the baby can be extracted to save its mother's life, DDE has been used. If it is not the obstetrician's goal to kill the baby but merely to extract it, craniotomies are deemed permissible. Onscombe provided this example, say she meets her mortal enemy on a cliff. If her enemy falls off because she accidentally falls against him, she is blameless. Even though the unintended effect of the enemy's death is welcome to her, after the fact. Others have criticized the ways in which consequentialism seems to ignore issues of justice in cases where an unjust act or even a human sacrifice might serve to maximize benefits for others. What is Applied Ethics?
Applied ethics is the study of existing ethical principles in practical fields of human endeavor, such as medicine, engineering, business, law, and environmentalism. Applied ethics also extends to new moral rules for new situations, such as the rights of airline passengers and disaster victims, moral issues involved in human cloning, and consumer protection. In this sense, applied ethics is practical ethics it is a study of ethics of practice. In addition, applied ethics can be more critical as it applies theoretical. Moral systems and moral theories to practices and fields outside of philosophy. Existing rules and behavior in a given field may be theoretically justified or criticized by philosophical ethicists. In some cases, new moral directions may emerge. Environmental ethics is a good example of the theoretical dimension of applied ethics. What is applied ethics? Applied ethics is the study of existing ethical principles in practical fields of human endeavor, such as medicine, engineering, business, law, and environmentalism. Applied ethics also extends to new moral rules for new situations, such as the rights of airline passengers and disaster victims, moral issues involved in human cloning, and consumer protection. In this sense, applied ethics is practical ethics it is a study of ethics of practice. In addition, applied ethics can be more critical as it applies theoretical. Moral systems and moral theories to practices and fields outside of philosophy. Existing rules and behavior in a given field may be theoretically justified or criticized by philosophical ethicists. In some cases, new moral directions may emerge. Environmental ethics is a good example of the theoretical dimension of applied ethics. How have consequentialists responded to criticism? Some consequentialists, such as philosophy professor and author Kai Nielsen, 1926, have simply bitten the bullet and asserted that whatever saves the most lives is good. Nielsen is famous for his 1972 article in Ethics, in defense of utilitarianism, which provides the example of a fat man wedged in a cave, the waters are rising and his companions are trapped behind him. Nielsen asserts that if the fat man were humanely dispatched by an exploding stick of dynamite, conveniently on the scene, there is no violation of morality. Consequentialists have responded to the criticism of being unjust by claiming that rule consequentialism can allow for justice because a just rule will result in better consequences. And in the long run unjust behavior will fail to improve people's lives. For example, in an immediate situation a doctor might sacrifice a healthy patient so that six others who need organ transplants may live. But the rule followed in the sacrifice of the healthy patient would undermine confidence in doctors. And in the long term more harm than good would result from killing the healthy patient. 
Others have pointed out the obvious problem of calculating consequences in the future. Another strong objection to consequentialism, voiced by Bernard Williams, 1919-2003, is that the focus on results with everyone counting the same undermines the integrity of an agent by ignoring the importance of personal projects to that agent. In a famous example, Williams imagines that a traveler is asked to kill one Indian to save nine more from being shot. He argues that the consequentialist approach violates the importance to the traveler of his own moral identity as someone who does not kill others. How have consequentialists responded to criticism? Some consequentialists, such as philosophy professor and author Kai Nielsen, 1926, have simply bitten the bullet and asserted that whatever saves the most lives is good. Nielsen is famous for his 1972 article in Ethics, in defense of utilitarianism, which provides the example of a fat man wedged in a cave, the waters are rising and his companions are trapped behind him. Nielsen asserts that if the fat man were humanely dispatched by an exploding stick of dynamite, conveniently on the scene, there is no violation of morality. Consequentialists have responded to the criticism of being unjust by claiming that rule consequentialism can allow for justice because a just rule will result in better consequences. And in the long run unjust behavior will fail to improve people's lives. For example, in an immediate situation a doctor might sacrifice a healthy patient so that six others who need organ transplants may live. But the rule followed in the sacrifice of the healthy patient would undermine confidence in doctors. And in the long term more harm than good would result from killing the healthy patient. Others have pointed out the obvious problem of calculating consequences in the future. Another strong objection to consequentialism, voiced by Bernard Williams, 1919-2003, is that the focus on results with everyone counting the same undermines the integrity of an agent by ignoring the importance of personal projects to that agent. In a famous example, Williams imagines that a traveler is asked to kill one Indian to save nine more from being shot. He argues that the consequentialist approach violates the importance to the traveler of his own moral identity as someone who does not kill others. What is distinctive about analytical political philosophy? Twentieth-century analytic political philosophers have for the most part supported liberal and egalitarian values. And they have done so in formal writing that is in itself apolitical. What is distinctive about analytical political philosophy? Twentieth-century analytic political philosophers have for the most part supported liberal and egalitarian values. 
and they have done so in formal writing that is in itself apolitical. Who was Isaiah Berlin? Isaiah Berlin, 1909 to 1997, was renowned for his work on ideals of liberty in democratic societies. He was born in Latvia and educated at Oxford. He was president of Wolfson College. Oxford, from 1966 to 1975. He is famous for his distinction between positive and negative liberty and his criticism of Marxist ideas of history. Berlin was a brilliant and elegant speaker and delivered lectures on the British Broadcasting Corporation, often without notes. Berlin's major works include Historical Inevitability, Two Concepts of Liberty, 1959. Four Essays on Liberty, 1969, Russian Thinkers, 1978, Against the Current, Essays in the History of Ideas. 1979, Personal Impressions, 1980, The Crooked Timber of Humanity. Chapters in the History of Ideas, 1990, and the Sense of Reality, Studies in Ideas and Their History, 1996. Who was Isaiah Berlin? Isaiah Berlin, 1909 to 1997, was renowned for his work on ideals of liberty in democratic societies. He was born in Latvia and educated at Oxford. He was president of Wolfson College. Oxford, from 1966 to 1975. He is famous for his distinction between positive and negative liberty and his criticism of Marxist ideas of history. Berlin was a brilliant and elegant speaker and delivered lectures on the British Broadcasting Corporation, often without notes. Berlin's major works include Historical Inevitability, Two Concepts of Liberty, 1959. Four Essays on Liberty, 1969, Russian Thinkers, 1978, Against the Current, Essays in the History of Ideas. 1979, Personal Impressions, 1980, The Crooked Timber of Humanity. Chapters in the History of Ideas, 1990, and the Sense of Reality, Studies in Ideas and Their History, 1996. What was tragic about Schlick's death? After the Nazis came to power in Germany and Austria. Many members of the Vienna Circle fled to the United States and England. Schlick remained. Although not Jewish, he was distressed by what was then happening in Germany. While walking up some steps at the University of Vienna to teach a class on June 22, 1936, Johann Nelbach, a former student, confronted Schlick with a pistol and shot him. Schlick died of a chest wound. Nelbach was convicted but soon pardoned, after which he became a member of the Nazi party. Although Schlick was not Jewish, 
logical positivism was condemned as Jewish thought by the Nazis. Who was R? Hair? Richard Mervyn Hare, 1919-2002, was a professor of moral philosophy at Oxford University. And he later taught at the University of Florida. In his The Language of Morals, 1992, he argued for the prescriptive nature of moral judgments and their universalizability, or ability to be generalized. In Freedom and Reason, 1963, and Moral Thinking, Its Levels, Method, and Point, 1981. Hare held that ethical concepts are used according to logical rules that support the truth of utilitarianism. The utilitarianism propounded by Hare was two tier. Providing for both act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism. Act utilitarianism requires that we do singular actions that will result in the best consequences. Whereas rule utilitarianism requires that we follow rules that will result in the best consequences. Who was George Santayana? George Santayana, born Jorge Agustin Nicolas Ruiz de Santayana y Borras, 1863-1952, was a philosopher, poet, art critic, and author of the international best-selling novel The Last Puritan, 1935, New Edition, 1936. His father was Spanish and he was born in Madrid but his Scottish mother brought him to the United States when he was nine and enrolled him in the Boston Latin School. In 1889 he received a Ph.D. in philosophy from Harvard, with Josiah Royce, 1855-1916, as his advisor. In 1892 he accepted an instructorship at Harvard and later became professor of philosophy. Teaching there for 20 years. Santa Yana students included authors Conrad Aiken, T.S. Eliot, Robert Frost, Wallace Stevens, and Walter Lippmann, as well as U.S. Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter. Santa Yana retired from Harvard in 1912 and spent the remainder of his life writing and traveling in Europe. His main publications are The Sense of Beauty, 1896, Interpretations of Poetry and Religion, 1900. The Life of Reason, 5 volumes, 1905-1906, Skepticism and Animal Faith, 1923, The Realms of Being. Four volumes, 1927 to 1940, Persons and Places, 1944, The Middle Span, 1945, and My Host the World, 1953. In addition to numerous other books and essays, Santa Yana's published correspondence to over 350 respondents runs to eight volumes. Air's version of logical positivism? In Language, Truth, and Logic, 1936, 
published when he was just 26. Air forcefully and with great panache presented the main tenets of logical positivism as a doctrine broadly relevant to philosophy. He asserted the empiricist doctrine that all of our knowledge of the world comes from sensory experience. The truth or falsity of statements was dependent on whether they could be verified in terms of that experience. Only statements that could be true or false were meaningful. It followed from these bold claims that metaphysical, religious, and ethical statements, if they were not true by definition, could assert nothing meaningful about reality. Statements about the self, the external world, and the minds of others had to be confirmed by sensory experience, if they were to be meaningful. Concerning the existence of God, for example, Ayer maintained that the question itself was not meaningful because no possible experience could determine its truth or falsity. Ayer's ethical theory was emotivist, that is, ethical judgments were held to be expressions of emotions. <laughs>